Hey everybody, I'm Brian. Hello everybody, this is Joe G. Hey, I'm Shannon. Hi, I'm Ron. Hey, this is Steve. Oh, and we can't forget about Marcel. Oh, hey. I can't see, by the way, I can't see the chat over here. Good morning, USA. How are we all going this morning? Brian, Claude, how are you guys? Good morning. I'm great. Hey, Claude. I'm good. Good to see you guys. <coughs> um, now, for today's topic, we'll continue on from what we were left off last week with scratch, scratch building and kit bashing. Um, we've got Claude on as a guest this week. Um, it looks like I'm going to have some issues with chat on the screen, so we're not going to worry about that too much. Um, but in saying that, uh, I guess first things first is we can jump over to chat, say hello to the guys there. So let's see what we got there. We've got Steve Arnold, New First Railroad. Um, that's you, Claude. Dale, PRR Guide Base. Um, where are we? Just a lot of names I keep repeating. Uh, is there any other names you can see there, Brian? Yeah, that's the Sparky 107, 107. There's Bill, which you said. Um, yeah. We got Dale, which you said. There's Melvin Fackler. Melvin's in the house. Gary's in the house. Gary Corbin. Norman that's Rowe. Pat Norman Rowe's in there. And Norman Rowe is here as well. And then Steve Arnold is here, like you said. Steve's not feeling well. We're glad that Steve's at least in chat for us today. We hope you feel better, Steve. Dave, BNSF N scales in the house as well. Kenward Griffin. And that's all I see for now, and I hope I didn't miss anybody. And I want to say good morning to Claude. I want to say good morning to anybody I might have missed. We were talking about scratch building versus kits and stuff last week. And this week, we wanted to talk about Claude, something Claude's doing. Claude is building a trestle, and we want him to go into more detail about that, let y'all ask him some questions in chat as well. And so I'm going to kind of shut up and turn this over to Claude, where he's going to kind of present his trestle and what he's going to be doing with that too. Uh, Shannon, do you have anything before he gets into that? Um, well, I was going to say I've got some stuff in my glass cabinet that I just remembered that might be able to help Claude. So if he wants, I can hold up a couple of things which, you know, might help people understand how he, you know, constructed his trestle kind of deal. Um, otherwise, apart from that, like as I said, I've got a bit of an issue with live chat popping up on our screen tonight. Like it's just appearing blank for whatever reason. I don't no know worries. why, but yeah, it's not going to matter. Um, but yeah, so apart from that, I'll let Claude take the reins. I'll be back in like 30 seconds, but I don't think Claude needs me for those 30 seconds. <laughs> Alrighty, well, um, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but I'm modeling the uh, Denver Rio Grande narrow gauge mainly, um, which was uh, snaked through the mountains to get to the mining towns and to the mines. Uh, of course, they used a lot of trestles, uh, timber trestles back in the day uh, when they first opened it. And they're just, timber trestle to me is just awesome looking. Um, very early on, they changed out a lot of those timber trestles because they would catch fire from the engines going across. So they changed them out for steel uh, where they still needed them. But uh, early on, they had timber trestles. I'm going to show you a picture here. Hopefully you can see this. This is a JV Models kit of a, of a trestle. Um, and I'm gonna use part of this kit, but I'm gonna add to it because I'm gonna do a lot more than what this kit will do. This kit will do uh, up to 18 inches high and up to 36 inches long. Um, I am gonna have one that's 36 inches long, but it's not gonna be quite that high. And then I've got another one that's gonna be about four foot long. Also won't be quite as high. Um, but they should still look pretty impressive. Uh, let me turn my camera around here, if I can figure out how to flip that around. Yeah. Um, Claude, just letting you know, these are the kind of things I've got on me right now that might help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Claude, do you have two of those kits? I'm sorry? Do you have two of those kits? No, I've just got the one. Okay. I've just got the one, but um, uh, I decided I wanted more... Um, 
more trestle than what that's going to have. I'm also going to have some smaller ones up in, in the mountain itself, but they won't be near as long as these two. Mm. Uh, let me just flip the camera around and I uh, don't know how to do it on here. I don't know that I can do it on here. Let's well, see. Oh, here feet. we go. There it is. That's what I wanted. Okay. The first one's going to be right here. Um, actually, this is not the first one. This will be the second one. This will be the four footer. Right in this corner, as I come around this corner right here, um, the trestle will pick up about where this angle iron is. This won't be here. Uh, and then this is going to be the ground level across here. And the, the trestle will come right about where these angle irons are over to the top of this backdrop. So that will be the first one. Let me back up and you can see how long that's going to be. And that's about four feet across there. So wow. that should be pretty impressive. If I can get the right backdrop on it, I think it'll look really good. The terrain from the lower section is going to actually go up into it. So there won't be a, a shelf type of divide there. It'll be all one scene. So that should be look pretty good. And you can see that when you first come in the door. Um, the other one I'm going to do uh, comes up out of the out of the town here, Timberline Junction, and comes up here and we'll start right here where the paper is, this template is. Uh, and it's going to be a, a double curved uh, trestle. And it'll come around, if I can get back far enough, it'll come back around and then go into the mountain just about here. Uh, you can see I've started some of the supports for the, uh, what will be the mountain complex. And if you think of uh, the Matterhorn at Disneyland, if you've ever been there, it's kind of going to be the same way. You know, structural inside and look like a mountain on the outside. But uh, I'll be able to get inside and do anything I need to do inside there. But that's where the trestles will be. This one will be the highest one, actually, as far as from the railhead to the uh, valley below it. It'll be oh, about 12 inches. Um, and I'm thinking that's about 80, 90 feet, something like that scale feet. Uh, once it comes off the, off the bluff right there and, and then before it comes back into the mountain. Uh, then on the other side over here, where the standard gauge is going to be, where I've got this as part of the upper return loop, uh, that will be a steel trestle right here in this part. I've got this where I can just take this wood out and put the steel trestle in right there. Uh, and then I'll, I'm planning on putting a timber trestle just above it, just a short one above it for the narrow gauge as it winds up the mountain. But that's pretty much what I'm going to do. Um, I've made a template. Let me get, get that out here for you. And this is just on a piece of scrap uh, ceiling tile uh, board. And of course, you can see I've used it for other things. But mm -hmm. I make the template here where I can make them as tall as I want. So this is as tall as they would ever be. And I probably won't ever get this tall, but I'm going to make them this tall so that I can then just cut them off wherever the terrain's going to be as I come across, because the train's going to change coming through here. Um, this will all be kind of a rock uh, formation here, similar to the High Line on the Silverton Durango uh, ride, and uh, have the trestle going across the top of that. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at on that. I haven't started on any of it yet. Uh, other, it's all in, in uh, concept stage. But uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Mm. Uh, if you got any questions, I'll try and answer them. But yeah, well, I, was I, gonna, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I do, but we'll go with what Shannon has probably first. Yeah. Go ahead, Shannon. Yeah, well, I was just going to add with what Paul was saying. You know, like how he's got the kit there with him, and you know he's going to modify it a little bit and whatnot. Now, with some of the stuff that I've got here to help you out. Put, you know, to help with what you're saying, Claude. Um, like I've got a small kit, you know, that I got a couple of years ago now mm -hmm. um, for a trestle bridge. And personally, I'm yet to open the bag for the kit. All right, so keep that in <laughs> mind. I'm yet to open the bag, but the wonderful thing about some of these kits that I found, and it'll probably be the same with the kit that you've got there, Claude, is they come with all these beautiful instructions so you can actually lay the pieces together, you know? So, like you've got these instructions here which gives you different radiuses or you can do, you know, you can do straight or whatever. 
Yeah. And, you know, like, as you've done, Claude, like, you've made a template of the trestle, but, you know, at the same time, if you get, you know, these di these diagrams, you just, you know, what I've done is I photocopied it, modified it a little bit for the height I needed, you know, added in extra cross beams where I needed and whatnot, and, you know, like, as I said, I bought this kit two years ago, haven't touched the actual kit itself, and I think I've built four trestle bridges already, you know, since I've got the kit. Yeah, yeah that's exactly how you do it. Uh, I did the same thing. Uh, to make that template that I'm going to use, um, I photocopied the template on the plans uh, because I didn't want to ruin the plans. Uh, I used to do the same thing with my airplanes. Um, I'd buy buy a kit, and the first thing I'd do is go down to the copy place and have them print them out because they're pretty good sized plans for those. But that way, you didn't ruin the original plan, and you could you could do whatever you wanted to to the one that you photocopied. And the only thing you got to make sure of is when you photocopy it um, that you do it in one to one and make sure the scale's the same. Uh, it's always a good idea to, to measure um, your photocopy and and check it against the original and make sure it's the same. Mm, yeah, exactly. And and the upside is you know for those who are on a budget, you know like what do I spend on this? I spend thirty bucks on this for one kit, and two years later. You know, what's thirty dollars in two years? You know, peanuts. Yeah. You know, like in yeah, your exactly. case Yeah, like in your case for your trestle bridge probably would have cost a bit more than thirty dollars, but you know, same deal, like you spread over however many years and however many bridges you can make out of the plans themselves, it it's one of those things that just keeps on giving with, you know, kits like this. And well and the other thing you can do if you don't want to buy the kit or buy a kit um, I went on to uh, uh, Google and just Google timber trestles. I found some plans there for uh, New Hampshire, Northern New Hampshire Railroad or something like that. I mean, it's not in anywhere in my area, but it had some really nice plans drawn to scale. Um, you know, they rouged them down, obviously, but they're, they're drawn and, they're, and they tell you what the scale is on the plan. It's almost like having a blueprint. And yeah. tells you what size the lumber was. It tells you how much you know they used and all that kind of stuff. What the foundations were, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you can take those and, and print those off for nothing. Um, no, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's amazing what you can find online if you look. Mm. Um, it's just the it's, it. it's just the mathematics trying to convert it to your scale. That's the thing, that. Yeah, then, yeah. It's, know, well. You know, you, the best thing you can do as a as a model railroader is buy a scale rule. Uh, it's got every scale on there from O to O to N, and you can't beat one of those. No, you can always go in and go by that. And if you've got a quarter uh, a quarter inch to the foot or something like that scale on your on your plan, then you can mod you can take and calculate what that's going to be in your scale feet. Mm. Ah, what do you got there, Brian? It looks like it's a more important than a scale ruler. The micro trains track gauge and coupler <laughs> height, because in my scale, this is more important right here. And in scale, you got to have, at least I do for a newbie. Yeah, I've, yeah, well, I've got I've got two of those, and and then and 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 no, no, and M R A. Gauge. Mm -hmm. you, the, is the acronym right? Oh, I don't know. I'll get tongue tied like with that thing. Height gauge, track gauge, all kind of gauge. It were, I lost mine one time and I, I went crazy looking for it. And, and here's a great story. I actually was shooting video of what I was doing and I was able to go back to my old video that I had been shooting and see where I dropped it. And that's how I found it. <laughs> that's I got dedication. Love. There you go. I got lucky. I was going crazy when I lost that thing. Yeah. But uh, Claude, I wanted to ask you a question about that that, that metal trestle. Uh, uh -huh. what, what are you going to use for that? And what are you going to use for road bed and stuff on that? You said you were going to take that wood out. What What I'm going to use is uh, is uh, made by Micro Engineering. Uh, they make the, the, I use their rail uh, to to lay my track with, and they make flex track. They make turnouts. Uh, they make bridges. Um, but it's a uh, it's 
prototypical of the uh, uh, what they used in the in the Colorado mountains. Um, in fact, when we went on our trip out of Chama, New Mexico to Antonito, we went over two of the bridges that looked just like their kit. Um, but they make they make that they make add-ons to it, so you can make it as long as you want. Now they're not cheap kits, and these aren't something that would be easy to as easy as a timber trestle to scratch build. You could do it, but it would take structural plastic and stuff like that to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be a little tougher to do. And I think that's why those end up being so expensive because you can look on eBay and you can find some good deals on there, but you got to pay attention to the kit because all of their kits, extension kits or the regular bridge kits, the box looks pretty much the same. The pictures can be different and the wording's different on it. So you've got to look and see because you'll see one for $15. Then you'll see something that looks just like it for $55 or $60. Well, they're two different things. Uh, they go together, but they're, they're different. They're, you know, one of them's more probably the full bridge or a full bridge. And then the other one's probably an add on uh, extra legs or something like that. But uh, you can get those and build them as long as you want, you know, to if Who you want to add on that product? Who did you I'm say makes that product? Who did you say makes that product? Uh, micro engineering. They're in uh, Missouri, I believe. I can't remember the town that they're in, but they're in Missouri. Uh, but they make turnouts and, and rail and switches and uh, bridges. Um, trying to think of what else they make. That's the main thing they make is track. So they make it. Uh, they don't make sectional track. But they do make flex track and actual just plain rail. And then they make uh, flexible bridge um, sections that you can put on top of the trestles if you want. They're code 55 and HO. Um, and and I've got some of those. I don't know if I use them or not, but I've got some of those. Uh, so it's they're really good for for bridge parts if that's what you want to do. Um, and just look at them up. Micro engineering. They're, well, pretty, they're thinking, pretty common. I was thinking about going all lumber, but you kind of got me thinking that that might be nice to do that that way. Although it sounds like it might be a little costly, but it's yeah. And I great. don't know if they make it an end scale uh, uh, steel bridge. Not to say that you couldn't couldn't take the HO and, and make it work. I just don't know that they make it anything but HO. So HO yeah. and HON three, which you know, same yeah. scale, just different gauge on the track. So. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't checked into that because I don't do it in scale. So I understand. But I haven't noticed it. What would be really nice is if, if it was half the price since it's half the size. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything would be nice if it was half the price. <laughs> That's right, man. It'd be, I mean, y'all would be really jealous of us if it were half the price. I imagine oh, yeah. we'd get more converters, too. Well, it's it, you already got the advantage of having being able to put twice as much in the space. So, yeah. well, so if it costs twice as much to put twice as much, it should be half the price. Yeah, yeah. There we go. it all works out in the wash. Yeah, well, it doesn't. It, all it comes doesn't out to be about the same. But I tell you what, I, you know, I've got enough space to keep me busy forever, and that's what I love about it. I just hope I don't start having you know problems down the road seeing and handling them and things like that. I know that can happen. Yeah. Well, when I when my son brought up the the thought of doing this, and um, I thought, well, yeah, we, we could do narrow gauge, and that way I could put a lot more in a in a small space because I was going to do maybe a third of what I've got. And of course, the more I looked at it, the, the more stuff I moved out of the way, and the bigger the layout got. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a disease, I think. It is. But. Uh, as you can see behind me, this this room was actually being used as an inside storage, so we, you know, temperature controlled kind of storage, um, because we do have extreme summers and can be pretty cold in the winter too. So stuff we didn't want in the attic was in here, uh, but there's there's not a lot of it. So kind of so, kind of kind of sounds like Australia, where we we live by the heat or we live by the aircon. Yeah. Yeah, Oklahoma is, it, you know, Will Rogers said it best. He said, if you don't like the weather, just wait 15 minutes because mm -hmm. it will change. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I've, I've been out working when I was working in, in plumbing, uh, digging outside, and uh, started out 70 degrees in the morning. And by the time we went home, there was snow on the ground. So, snow and sleet on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it can change pretty quick here. Yeah. 
Now, sorry to interrupt. I'm just looking through chat at the moment. Um, got a couple of guys talking. Uh, let me just get back into this for a second. Um, we had Park Valley Railroad saying making trestles. That's something I haven't tackled yet. Although I did make a coal transfer facility that is a trestle type affair. <laughs> um, Leslie Gilpin, I took photos of trestles on various routes in Canada, which are now for leisure use. Gave me a better idea how they are constructed. Um, he also said he expects Brian to build some trestles mm. out of skewers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, they oh. make perfect trestles. Well, here's the uh, here's, <laughs> yes. here's the template off of that kit. <coughs> so I'm kind of going to go with this as far as how I design it. But then the the one I was telling you about that I found online, it's the New York, New Hampshire, and something railroad of 1908. But this is what I found online. So you can see how detailed that is. Oh, it's wow. It's got all the information you could want. Uh, shows some of the shorter bridges, how they built them. Um, a little bit different style. And then here's here's the page on all the footings. So this was all just, the, you know, pictures on Google that I downloaded and, and printed off. That's awesome. Lots of information out there oh. if you just look oh, for yeah, it. Oh, yeah, there is. Definitely. Definitely lots of information. Excuse me. Um, let's see what else is it. Um, Gary Corbin. Uh, I think that goes for any Midwest state board. I work construction as well. The weather can be crazy. Um, certainly North Carolina this week. I was driving the convertible a week ago. It's no Thursday night, and it's going to be back in the sixties tomorrow. That was Park Valley Railroad. Um, more about Brian Skewers from Norman Ray. Yeah, um, I was going to say, you know, if you're new to modeling, if you save up a little while, you can get all these building products right here. It costs a dollar. So, you know, just save up and get, you can build forever with these things for a dollar. Mm. A little bit of glue. Hey, Brian, are those bamboo? I don't even know, Claude. Um, and you know, you you brought up a great point about those because um, I think you I think they are, and I think you're right because these, which I use, you know, when I need longer, are much less. If I can snap these very easy, these have give. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of good they do, really, because when you get a lot of them together, they don't have much give at all, but they do. You know what I mean? It's, there's, a, yeah. there's some flex. And right. I, I actually think that works out for me. Yeah, I've used them. I've used the bamboo skewers in when I was building airplanes um, mm -hmm. to, to stick in and use as reinforcing, um, like on a firewall, going the side of the airplane into the, into the in middle of the firewall. And it being bamboo, it's not nearly as liable to shear off as wood would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and like I said, I noticed that when I was doing the longer ones that because what I do is when I push them through that hard board, I, I have to twist them down hard and then I just glue each side. Um, David BNF in scale made an awesome suggestion to use bolts like that, but I just didn't go to that much trouble, which I probably should have, but it had been a ton of bolts and made it really heavy. Um, but anyway, um, I noticed that the, the longer ones would snap easily going through there. Where those bamboo ones, I could shove, I could shove them through good. They, you know what I mean. And um, it was kind of, it's kind of upsetting. I can't find the skewers much longer than you know about twelve inches though. Well, um, they're, made, they're made to put on your on your grill. Shish kebab. Yeah. that's what they're for. Well, and, and that's the thing. In, in in the summer, if I catch it right, I can find an 18 inch one. Mm -hmm. And I've done that before, but I didn't buy enough of them. And when I see them next time, I'm gonna get a bunch because 16 inches is I don't have much that's taller than that, um, and don't really ever want anything much taller than that. Um, so I just need to buy a bunch when I come across of them. Dollar General has them um, when they do their like sales for barbecue sales and stuff. And Walmart does as well. I saw them both places. 
um, if anybody's interested in those. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I just picked you, mine up the grocery store, hanging, hanging, you know, in one of the aisles, you know, as the extra stuff. Uh, what, what are you using to add to those kits? Uh, I'll be using balsa and basswood. Uh, I've got a ton of that stuff from when I was building airplanes because anytime I'd go to a, an estate sale or something like that where they had it, I'd buy all the balsa and stuff they had because balsa is expensive. Mm. Um, yeah, it's great. Fiber, nice there, but it can be really expensive. Yeah, but so, it can be really easy uh, to use, which is, you know, it makes it worth it in the end. Yeah, I've even been giving it away to the, the members of the club I used to belong into, the, the few of them that still build. There's not very many guys that build anymore. And this, all this boss is just going to go bad if I don't get rid of it. But I've got a huge yeah, box of stuff that's going to be small enough for what I'm, yeah, I can send you some for, for, uh, for what I'm going to use. Uh, it's very small dimension compared to what I was using building airplanes with. So most of the stuff I've got is too big to use on the layout. Now I will build some, probably use it to, to, uh, scratch build some structures and stuff like that. Although I've got a ton of, of stuff from, uh, Campbell kits and stuff like that that uh, that I bought on eBay and and we're gonna put on the layout, but uh, they're all balsa wood and basswood too, so we can add to them really easy. Yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's what, what I was curious about. That's what kind of what I was thinking about for mine, a, at least one of them. But you got me definitely thinking about that metal one as well. Yeah, it's they're nice looking. The, the metal one's a really nice looking bridge. Um, and it'll fit more uh, of what most of the guys out there um, are doing, because most guys are modern, or more, a lot more modern than what I'm doing. We're doing very late 40s, very early 50s, so I get the very, very early diesels, and then still have the steam too. So um, that's what I'm doing, and it's much tougher to find. I just found some vehicles from a gal in England. Uh, got a real good buy on those. Uh, 12 bucks a piece and, and I bought five, if I bought five, she sent me an extra one. So I got six for, for what, a, you know, whatever that was, $60, something like that. But they're really nice. They're a lot nicer than I was expecting to get. Um, and they fit the era. They're all 1941, 42 in there. So they will fit in the layout really, really well. And it's hard to find that era. You find a lot of early 60s stuff, you know, late fifties and early sixties, but that's past our time. So it's really tough to find what I want as far as the vehicle. Yeah, I'll uh, find. Yeah, I'll find the same. Considering I mainly model transitional era, which you know is between the forties to sixties. You know, you can find a lot of yeah, as you said, you know, mid to mid fifties to early sixties stuff. But when it, anything before that, it's kind of you know needle in the haystack kind of deal. Well, there you know when especially on vehicles, if you stop and think about it, if you're modeling the the late forties. They didn't build cars for most of the 40s uh, because of the war. Yeah, so exactly. They had, you had a lot of 30s cars in there. Well, you can't even find those really online. They're real tough to find. Yeah, usually, um, you, yeah, usually you have to 3D print them, white metal kits, yeah. something. And then the you know, and then in the 50s, the auto industry went crazy again with with all the building stuff that they did and all the guys coming back from war and stuff. So auto industry's got a bunch of stuff from to choose from in the 50s yeah and I, I got a question real quick um because but for both of y'all um late 40s late late 40s early 50s what would be common locos to be running in regard to because claude piqued my interest when he said very early diesels and so I was wondering, what are those very early diesels, like F7s? You know what I'm asking you? Well, they'd be more, I've got F3s. I don't have any right. F7s. I've got the F3s. Yeah, F3s. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not yeah, very familiar ones. with the diesels. Like, I'm more of a steam guy myself, but it's not, you usually find a lot well, of experimental like that. Hmm. Actually, wouldn't the U50s be around that era? They were, they were out in the 50s, 60s, weren't they? The U50s. The, which ones? The U50s. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I think the GE U50 was out like in 1952 or something, from memory. It or could something be. Like that. What I did, what I did, uh, Brian, and I'll send you the link. I'll email it to you. Um, it's um, rosters of the Durango, Denver, Rio Grande Western, not Durango, Denver and Rio Grande Western rolling stock and engines and it goes through their entire history 
So okay. you can look that up and there's a lot of photos of those engines and it also tells you which ones they are. Uh, of course, the standard gauge had a lot more, you know, they had a lot, lot more engines on them. The, the narrow gauge ran mainly consolidations um, and C-19 class, C-17 class early on and then the, you know, the uh, consolidations after that, K-27s up through uh, K-36s, 37s, mm-hmm. which are still running now in Durango and, and Chama both. Actually, they've just got one back into steam, I think, last week, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they got one that they just re- finished one. I think it's a K-37. Yeah, I think it was, what was and, it, number 763 or something? Uh, no, it's four, it would probably be the 400 series, four something, but it's they changed it. When they redid it, they did it to oil. Yeah. Um, and, of course, part of that's from response to the fires they had last year. Or a year before last. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, before we keep going, um, it's about halfway through the show now, so we do have an intermission video that um, Brian has put together for us. Um, I haven't really got an idea what's going to be in it. Well, we, what I want to <laughs> say before he plays it is, y'all, Ron Driscoll has not been well. He hasn't been feeling well. But he's starting to turn the corner, his words, and starting to feel a little better. And so we want to welcome him back. We all missed him. And so we made a little video of his stuff and hope you'll go over and check out his channel. He had a new, he uh, actually put out a video kind of letting everybody know he was okay. We want y'all to check that out as well. All right, that's all. All right. Okay, I'll play the video. So, okay, this is a coffee break. So if you want to go grab a coffee, you know, go grab a coffee or whatever. Um, grab grab something to snack on or go to the toilet if you need to. So, but otherwise, yeah, sit down, relax, enjoy the intermission video, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Hey everybody, it's Ron. How y'all doing? Uh, I know it's been a while since I posted a video. Uh, been really sick since um, the end of October, and I know I haven't done a lot of modeling. Um, haven't really posted anything. I'm finally turning the corner and starting to feel a little better. So hopefully I'll have some um, videos up and posted soon Um, just want to say hey to everybody and let everybody know that i'm not dead yet so i'll see you later bye for now hi everybody i'm ron piskel and welcome back to Ron's Workbench. In this episode, episode 13, we're gonna start a new build. We're gonna build Valley Hardware and Plumbing Supply by Motrack Models. This is one of their latest models. I ordered a little while ago. And like I said in my last video, we're gonna start this build because I'm gonna try and enter this into a contest. So, as you can see, I haven't even opened it yet. So, let's open it together, take a look, see what's inside, and we'll get started. Okay, so like I said, I haven't even opened this box yet. So, got a new blade. So, let me get started. I have to So let's open up together, take a look, and see what's inside. Okay, so I'm just using the hobby knife to make a small mark on the strip okay. wood, then I'm lining like it up said, with the blade of the chopper so I can make a nice clean square cut. Okay. 
So I'm not the most graceful person in the world. And as you can see here, I start having a little bit of problem with the glue. I am just so used to the way that the weld bond flows out of the container. I'm trying to get used to using the uh, tacky glue. So you'll see a few times I have problems to get the glue started. So the instructions tell you to take the wall that's a little too too white and too light. Um, the India ink and alcohol wash is just a tad too dark. So I'm going to go ahead and add some more alcohol to the India ink wash to cut it. Now, I like using 99% alcohol because there's so little water content in it that the wash dries very quickly and it decreases your chances of getting warping. And I keep the, a jar of this on my workbench at all times for just weathering and, you know, anytime I need to apply a uh, like a shadow effect or anything like that and as the uh, as I use it and as the alcohol evaporates it tends to get a little and we'll use this one first since I already have a little bit of the wash on there and I'm just brushing it out on the next episode we're going to find out what this sponge has to do with this building on the next episode of Ron's Workbench. And we're back. Brian, forward. Hey, it was here. Alright, okay. It was just so quiet. I'm like, hang on, did something yeah. go wrong? <laughs> we're faking that. Leslie Gilpin said, just thinking Brian could run a DNR GW livery challenger on his layout. I think they had gone maybe by 1946, but why not? What do y'all know about that? I don't know oh, about that. Um, he'd be talking about what's called, uh, they're not called challenges, I've, it's exactly, they're called Z1s from memory. I'm just going to do a quick Google on that. Uh, challenger Z1. Uh, yeah. I've actually got an Atherin Challenger, um, but it's probably a little bit big for my layout, so I, I don't know that I'll keep it but it looks good <laughs> yeah um yeah from what i can well, where is it where is it, where is it i know if you look well, on apple's did, website it'll did, tell you uh-oh claude's claude's boss is guess it right no that was my wife bringing me a note i've got a friend coming i'm getting rid of one of my airplanes oh, okay and, uh, i get i'm giving it to him and he's on his way to pick it up so oh there you go yeah, no, nah, um, yeah, Brian, I think they called it um, Challenger Z1. Uh, I think Rare, uh, Denver Rare Grand bought them after Union Pacific or was finished with them or something like that when they moved to Diesel. Um, or, I don't know, I don't know the full throw up to look into it again. But, yeah, pretty much our standard Challenger, but there's slight differences from what I can tell physically, like on the front of the loco, piping on the boiler, um, and bits and pieces like that. So, Well, my question would be now, and, and one day I, this won't be a problem, but right now I don't know that I could pull many cars through the helix because of the grade. I mean, wh how much would that pull, one loco pull, um, at a 2.7? Pretty constant. Um, 2.7, hang on, Challenger... Oh, 
I've got a friend who has a 4% incline on his layout and my challenger was pulling 35 cars, which had a total weight of, um, what was it? I think I had a total weight of about three and a half pounds. Dude, that seems like a, that's, that seems like a lot. I guess they're very heavy, so I guess it would. Mm. Yeah, well, then it's not that they're heavy. Um, like the app with Athen, because I've I've got Athen challenges myself. I found they've always got traction tires on front drivers and rear drivers, so there's plenty of traction in regards to it. Um, um, okay. And as long as you know you don't have any rolling stock which have binding wheels or anything like that, you know it'll cool. pull mm -hmm. pretty much anything. Like you know, I've got a two Athen big boy. Yeah, two Athen big boys, and yeah, they're they're both strong enough that if I just had one dead, the other one drags the other one along quite easily. You know, no issues. So mm -hmm. you know, if the Logan can pull its own weight, you could easily pull you know forty, fifty cars quite easily. You know, especially what, a Loco that size. What kind of trucks do you use, Shannon? Oh, I've got a combination. I've got micro trains, Atlas, metal wheels, plastic wheels. I've got a combination. Yeah, but on the micro trains, do you use Bettendorf or do you use roller bearing? I wouldn't know the difference. All I know is, all I do is I put the, the, the rolling stock on the track. If it rolls really nicely, I'm happy. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> yeah. well, I use the Bettendorf and I wonder if I should use the roller bearing. Mm. Is is why I was asking. Look, well, I'm using uh, arch bar trucks, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, Brian, if you're actually talking about the actual bogey <coughs> design itself, that doesn't really matter much because that's just the molding to make it look like whatever the um, bogey is meant to look like. But when it goes to when it's in regards to the wheels fitting into the bogey, um, it all depends. As long as you've got the right width axle. Um, to fit into into that particular bogey, um, you should be sweet. So, you know, like if you put the wrong size ax axle in a bogey, it tends to, you know, have too much free play, bind up, fall out, you know, whatever. So that's why when you go into micro trains, onto the micro trains website for this example, you know, they'll list, you know, um, wheel sets for Riverosi bogies, wheel sets for Atlas bogies, wheel sets for micro trains, wheel sets for Rapido, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, so, and be careful what you're buying. Uh, I bought a bunch of these I'm showing you are old Central Valley. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of these, but these are actually have actual springs in them for suspension. Oh, yeah, I, yeah I, I know the design. I'm very, very They're metal with trucks that. and metal wheels, and I've bought it. I bought, I found one load on eBay that was, I mean, I stole it from the guy. <laughs> he, or he was giving them away, basically. I mean, I bought a whole bunch of them. I was so shocked I was able to buy, it was like 50 pair for, I don't know, $30 or something like that. It was crazy. Jesus Christ, 30 bucks. Yeah, yeah, because they normally go, you know, they'll put them on eBay, you know, just one set of HON3 trucks like this, arch bar trucks. One set, they'll put them on there for three ninety five, but they'll end up selling for, you know, fifteen or sixteen dollars for that one one set of trucks. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get them that cheap. Mm. Um, the HOs are not quite as bad; uh, they're not as quite as sought after, but they're just as nice a truck. That's an HO truck, um, but they're all metal. That's what I like about them. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I haven't I, put any. I've got some cars that have them on them already that I bought with the car with the truck on it already but uh, I hadn't actually installed any of these yet but I really like them they're they're really nice I use them for testing my rails and stuff and my turnouts after I build them uh, I just take the trucks and roll over them after but being metal wheels they roll really nice uh, I really like them the problem is they don't make them anymore so yeah. what's out there is out there um, now it's just looking on chat, um, Spark has been sending us some information that I missed. Um, let's see, where are we? So just before we went on break, um, before we went on our intermission, Tower Hill Railroad, I used top six standard down for a 
poles and tree trunks. I just grab a few after. I just grab a few every time I eat Chinese. Um, Norman Rowe was asking who's the best source for balsa wood in the US. Uh, Leslie Gilpin, foil containers from takeout food can be used to make corrugated sheeting. Uh, Dale from PRR Guy Base. Uh, I used to pull tabs from coffee creamers, bottles for the tops of rooftops, water tanks, and silos. Um, and yeah, that's what I've caught so far. And wow, people in chat, there's actually a few things in chat I'm trying to keep up with. Uh, I can answer the, the balsa wood question. Um, balsa USA. Uh, mainly makes airplane kits, but they do sell balsa separately. Um, another one is, uh, the name just went out of my head. Maybe I'll think about it. Think of it here in a minute. Uh, there's another. There's another company in the in the states that do it. Um, Aircraft Spruce has some, but they're mainly uh, they mainly sell stuff for full size airplanes. So theirs is a little iffy. But Balsa USA has got you know, pretty good selection. They're, it's a great, they're a great company to work with. If you get a, if they send you a piece and it's warped, you can tell them and they'll send you another one. They won't even, usually won't even have you send it back. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Balls USA is the main place I would get mine from uh, when I needed something particular that I didn't already have in my, in my stock. Um, I want to say the other place is United Balsa, but I can't swear to that. And I'm not here at my computer, so I can't, I can't look it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we were talking about the uh, the Challenger, and while Bill asked my radius on the Helix, and, and it's 12 except for in a couple places where I've got an 11.5 piece of Atlas snap to connect my flex if it was in a, in a real tough bend. Um, so would the Challenger have problems with an 11.5? Um, I think Athen Challengers were designed for 9.75 radiuses. Oh, okay. Um, I know okay. my HO, my HO will do a 25 inch radius. Yep. Yeah, um, that's what I've got. I'm just looking it up now, so give us two seconds. There you go. It's a, it's a Z8 Challenger that Denver Rio Grande Western had. How much, Shannon? How much? Yeah. Um, do you want me to break it to you gently? <laughs> <laughs> Probably more than the HO version. <laughs> Actually, no, the HO version is on par. Um, there you go. Okay, 11 inch radius. That's the minimum. Okay. Yeah, um, but looks more realistic or around a 15 inch radius or oh, wider. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to give you an idea, Brian, because uh, of Athens' last stint with the Challengers and Big Boys, um, a lot of the older models are, the prices have gone up a bit. Um, and then Big Boys have gone even further up because of 4014 going back into service as well. Um, so, you just got one, right? Sorry? You just got one, right? No, I got a big boy, and I stole oh. it. I stole it. Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make a lot of end scales very jealous right now. But the other day, I had a guy who was selling a big boy. He didn't want to deliver it. He didn't want to post it. It was strictly pick up, pay cash. Thank God, my mother-in-law. Interstate lives about half an hour away from him and he works around the corner from her. So he's dropping it off and I paid, what was it? 375 Australian, which is about 240 US. And, oh yeah, you did steal it. Yeah, and to give you, and for those who don't know, the last big boy I saw for sale on eBay sold for about, I think 400 US. And that was a 2007 production. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. You, you stole it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. That's crazy. There's well, I got a good price on that Atherin one that I bought, but um, and that's the only reason I got it because I thought, oh, it'd be really cool if it'll run on there. But it's just it's just too big an engine for for the space that I've got. It doesn't look right. Yeah, so, well, it runs well, but you know, if uh, I'm not mistaken, the two eight two Mikado ran on my line at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Mikados, yeah, the Mikados, the two eight twos. That's that's what they run now in Denver and, and Silverton, and uh, in Chama. Yeah, they run the Mikados, the K twenty eights, K twenty sevens, K twenty eights, K thirty sixes, thirty sevens. Yeah, I think I can get one of those for without DCC because I'm not yet, but I can you know add mm-hmm. it. But I think I can get a DCC ready one of those for you know about one forty or one fifty. Oh. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you on the on the end scale because I haven't priced them, but um, they're not as much as the challengers and the big boys. So. Yeah, well, the you know the engines I'm using here's here's a K27 here, and I've been got, getting mine on eBay because they're out of production right now. Um, that's K27. Mm-hmm. Must have it. And One, this is a HON3, of course. And, uh, it's a Blackstone. So Blackstone, they they retail for four ninety nine, and I think the most I paid for any of mine was four and a quarter. Okay. So I got them for a good price, but uh, they're fixing to come out, and I'm, I've got a couple on order. I've got a K twenty eight on order and a K thirty six on order, but they've been on order for a year and a half now. So I, you know, we don't know when they're going to be here. Actually, How do they run? I'm sorry. How do they run? Oh, they run great. They run fan. They run better than the old Japanese brass stuff that you had to get if you were uh, narrow gauge. And I've got a couple of those. Uh, one of them sitting on my desk because it doesn't run very well. It's, it needs to be cleaned probably. Mm. I've got another one that runs pretty well, but it's not DCC. These are all DCC with sound and everything. Mm. Uh, and they sound just they fabulous. Mm. Um, in fact, I could if you wanted, I could fire it up right quick. Go ahead, Shannon. Well, what you got? Well, I was going to say to Claude, um, a couple of years ago, um, an acquaintance of mine uh, that I don't talk to anymore because of some unfortunate circumstances, um, he had a couple of K26s in ON3, ON30, sorry. Um, Yeah. Fully brass, hand-built from scratch. And... I was going to buy them, and I'm like, I can't afford them. Yeah. But they were, but they were just really well built. Like they were nice and chunky and heavy. They weren't that crappy design where it only had one driver with one gear. Had like, you know, a couple of drivers with a couple of gears. So at least all the mechanism ran smoothly. They were beautiful. Okay. Let me get the. Uh, all right, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Let me get it pulled up here. Even has the even has the dynamo sound for the uh, light. Yeah, the dynamo generator. Yeah, I think most sound files have that for the steamers now, so it's pretty good. In saying yeah, that, it. in saying that, um, don't, don't mean to cut you short there, um, Claude, but I was just I just looked at the time. It's five to three. We've only got another five minutes left. Yeah, that's all right then. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Now, um, Brian, I don't think you'll need to, you know, let everyone know about um, what's going on during the week with shows because I have had it scrolling on the screen for the whole stream. 
perfectly fine with me. Yep, so that saves a couple of minutes there. Um, but one thing I was going to mention was I was keeping an eye on chat tonight. Um, didn't reach the numbers. I think we've got one more week left, but just remember, guys, I'm getting confused because I'm used to that camera, not that camera. Um, got one more week before the giveaway for this finishes. Um, as I said, I won't give this away until we hit 50 people in the live chat. So try and get your friends over for next week so we can give this away. Um, that's N scale. That uh, someone was giving away something HO. I can't remember who or what it was. Um, all our time schedules are conflicting with each other, so it's a bit hard for us to talk during the week, which we are fixing this week. Um, as we are, Brian. Now, apart from that, we're still trying to find out updates for the traveling box car because we want to get that on the road. Um, next month we're going to start our main giveaway, um, which we'll talk about that next month, which, you know, it's not going to be next week, it'll probably be the week after. Uh, apart from that, you know, for all those who are in chat at the moment, you know, chat, chat out your channels, subscribe accounts, you know, if you have anything. Um, is there anything I'm forgetting, Brian? No, um, I, I, what you, you were talking about is, um, you know, with our time zone differences, Shannon being asleep when we're awake and vice versa, planning and organizing this stream each week is a nightmare, basically. And so we've kind of finally ironed out a time where we're going to get to meet, and that's going to help us keep things running a little more smoothly. And so it took a while to do that, like I said, because for me to figure out what time it is at Shannon's, I have to subtract seven hours and add a day. All right. It's not like, you know, uh, and then so you think about that when we're at work, he's sleeping, vice versa, et cetera. So we finally figured out a way to get to meet. Yeah. And so uh, not, not to mention with everyone else being sick or, you know, you know, you know, even you guys over there interstate, you know, um, you you might be just finishing work, but Steve Arnold might be, you know, having dinner or something or, you know. Yeah, we got three hour time difference here too as well. So yeah, exactly. So trying to find a time where we can all get together and meet up and try and make this show better for you guys and actually discuss what we're going to do before the show starts, you know, is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a juggle, but, you know, we're getting there. Um, and we appreciate y'all hanging with us and everything and coming in each Saturday morning. And that's kind of what we're alluding to is that we're getting better and we're getting more organized. And Claude, I want to thank you for coming in today. Sure. It was fantastic. It was fun. That's why it did fly. And I still have a lot of questions. Maybe we can get you back in another time. I want to know a little bit. Want to know a little bit about that mountain where you're going to be able to pop up in there? Um, kind of how you figured that and how you did that. I have a lot of questions about that and um, a few other things. So we appreciate your time, man. And uh, your your layout's going to be fantastic. It already looks great. And uh, thanks for coming in and sitting with us today. Well, uh, Kenry Griffin has 133 subs. That's Mar uh, Excuse me, Marty has 146. That's Eminem Shortline. Dale PRR Guy Bass 153. Don't forget Sunday morning coffee and train. Uh, I got 389. Leslie Gilpin is at 103. Michael McCarville is at 1215. That's 1215 for Michael. And uh, Wilmer says he's going to have to do the whip it, okay, to get 50 watchers in here. Shannon, do you know what the whip it is? Um, I'm guessing it's talking about the song or have that gone straight yeah. over my head? I'll have to send you the video clip that I've got. <laughs> yeah. All so right, here we go, see. Jesus. I actually, you know, I should, I wanted to play it today for the intermission, but we needed to do a tribute to Ron Tuskell. But, um, yeah, Ron, uh, Wilmer does some fantastic stuff on his stream. Speaking of Wilmer, let's, let's thank him real quick before we get off. Yeah. Wilmer did three live streams this week y'all three and it was because other people weren't able to do theirs and people called on them 
and you know we kind of get used to meeting and getting together and chatting and all that on the weeknights and if he didn't do it there's a void and that wouldn't have happened so thank you very much wilmer we appreciate you yeah that's wilmer at Indian head valley railroad yeah definitely um yeah i caught his show yesterday or what was meant to be vinnie's show yesterday i caught his show there and that, that was quite interesting you know um i was actually surprised how many people actually knew who i was i was kind of going and going i wonder how many americans in here actually know who i am so, yeah, well, I know you can't do that, Shannon, but there's one of those every night. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, well, every night for you guys, it's bloody... That's you know, what I was saying. <laughs> you yeah. know, for, for me, I'm, I'm at work, it's like 11 a.m., and I'm stuck under the bottom of a BMW, swearing, you know, calling it every name under the sun, <laughs> as you do as a mechanic. Um, but, yeah, um, just trying to think of something else. I swear there was something else. Yeah. Um, that's well, right. Grandpa Rail 465, Joey Buzecki, uh, Buzek, I'm sorry, 97, Chuck 165, that's CDP 1965. I just didn't want to leave them out. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, there was a couple of guys that we spoke to, not last week, I think it was the week before. We did some video testing after the live stream two weeks ago, or as us Australians say, a fortnight ago. See, that's, that's an Aussie saying that fortnight means two weeks. That's how lazy yeah, we are. We make up words. Anyway, okay. um, but yeah, uh, there's one person I can't remember who it was that I spoke to. That um, if he's watching this to right now, um, I remember him saying he had a couch in his lair, and we spoke for a good hour. I was up till four in the morning talking to him about it. Um, so if he wants to send us an Gary. email, was it Barry? Gary. 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 Okay, it might have been Gary. I can't, I can't remember. And, and, and Shannon, you know, next week we got Schoolkill River John coming on to talk about his scratch built portals. Yeah. Um, there's video on, on that on his channel if you want to check that out because that's what we're going to be talking about next week. We also might have a very special guest coming in along with him as well to join us, and we're working on that right now. Yeah. Is that my mate with the kit bashing of certain items? Or... Oh, no not quite ready yet okay fair enough. but as soon as he's ready that guy's going to be a fantastic show that, that guy's a beast too oh my god as i said i i look up to him some days you know when i do some of my kit backing but we'll leave that for another video um apart from that yeah i'm gonna actually i am in the process of making a video for my channel i haven't posted a video in a very long time because i'm very bad at it when it comes to organizing my time like that i am going to go through and stock take my whole collection so that'll be a very interesting video i might give you guys a sneak peek next week on the intermission if i don't have it finished during the week so keep an eye out for that um and yeah as i said like you know this uh the forecast of what shows going on this week um has been scrolling across the screen all you know this whole stream so make sure you check out all those shows subscribe you know follow you name it watch those guys support those guys and yeah we'll see you guys next week thanks everybody thank right. you Claude. thank you, Claude. Appreciate thank you. see you brian thank you